Good evening, or good morning for whenever you're watching this. For our third installment from CBC High School, thanks to Randy, uh, Randy Gardner and his broadcasting team. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss a few things tonight. What I want to start with is the golf tournament, July 31st on a Saturday. We need you there. We want your help there. We need the players there. We need your money. Uh, backstoppers and the Special Olympics would appreciate it. Now tonight what we're going to talk about, we've got a few topics ahead. We've got legal and we have the uh, comm set we're going to discuss. Uh, George will be taped later. He got bamboozled into a game down in Farmington, but that's okay. Listen, uh, what we want to talk about that I find, I'm finding the last two weeks has been real important is game control both on the field, off the field. The biggest thing you, everybody needs to remember, there's a rule book, law book, call it what you want. Use them. Call the fouls. Blow the whistles on the fouls. Advantages are causing nothing but a lot of headache. Unless it's a goal scoring opportunity, try to avoid it. We had a situation uh, with regard to pregame. A couple of referees down in the uh, Farmington area. Before the game apparently did not converse with the timekeeper with regard to the horn. Whether they had one or didn't have one on the timer. At the end of the half, the fifth goal was scored allegedly at the last tenth of a second, whatever. Uh, there was some, some discussion, some argument. Neither official saw it. The officials ended up going to the timekeeper for that particular school who was winning. And you guess what? You, you can guess how that ended up. Yes, there was time on the clock. Uh, both coaches agreed there was no time on the clock, which might have been the best way to go. No time on the clock, goals, no score. Make it a four to nothing game at halftime instead of five. The uh, visiting coach was a little bit irritated. He was a lot irritated. He decided to take his uh, players and his soccer balls and go home. There seemed to be some confusion with regard to that. Uh, at the end of 40 minutes, or in this case a JV game, 35 minutes, uh, the first half, the game is over. Technically it is over by rule. You can leave. He left. He chose to leave. He didn't want to stay. I guess he didn't want to get the 8 to nothing uh, status. Needless to say, it caused a little bit of a riff. Uh, and there has been some discussion about it. Obviously, the coach is going to, for unsporting behavior, yeah, I'm sure the school is a little upset. But technically, try not to put yourself in those positions. Prepare yourself for something like that. Pay attention when it comes close to halftime, to the clock. One watch the clock, one watch the play. This is basic stuff, guys. Uh, just easy stuff. We had a situation where a goalkeeper made a mistake came out, caught the ball, stepped out of the box, or came out of the box and caught it. Doesn't matter. It was an oops. Whistle was blown. The discussion was indirect, direct, handball out of the box. What do you think? The explanation from the coach was there was nobody around. She didn't do it on purpose. So it should have been an indirect. When they set it down for the restart, instead of letting everybody get set up, since the game was pretty much one-sided, they came and they took the kick, put it in the back of the net. Needless to say, guess what happened next? More argument. Try to avoid those things. Just try to manage the chaos. Think about those things before you get into it, please. And then I don't have to answer three or four phone calls and then coaches and ADs are back and forth when we could have probably made that whole situation very digestible as referees. 
We had another situation where, where a coach went uh, in another JV game where a coach lost his mind for a moment. The official did the right thing, gave him his yellow card. The mistake was he stayed around to listen to more. The coach continued. The verbiage got really foul and abusive. The coach had to throw him out. The next thing you know, the coach decides he's Billy Martin bumping into Harry, uh, Harry Wendelstead, chest bumping him. Referee assault has to be written up. Needless to say, can it be avoided? Let's try to avoid those things, please, please. Arm and a half length away from any coach, any player that you're gonna caution, that you're gonna red card. Stay away from them. Give yourself an escape, but don't sit there and, and discuss the matter with them. Listen to them, then turn and walk away. But you can do that from a distance. Six feet is ample. Anyway, uh, just a couple of points. Management, management, management. Call the fouls, give the cards, uh, smile, and get your job done. Now, we will have elections. What I'm going to try to do is work out a situation with CBC here to use the outside, like we did for Uber Day last year, come report in on a Sunday, uh, fill out the ballots. We can talk to you for a little bit, maybe about an hour, hour and a half, uh, and then everybody can go about their way. We can't do it. It's not prudent to do it via email, via phone, via video, Skype, whatever you want to call it. Not prudent. And no, you don't have to have your driver's license. You just have to be a member and you have to be present. Uh, we will attempt that probably in, uh, I want to say the first couple weeks, when the kids get out of school, first couple of weeks of May, and it's only going to take a couple hours on a Sunday. We'll get it done, get it over with. Maybe sooner, but you'll be notified. Any questions or confusion, you know where to find me. Everybody else does when they got a problem. And that's not an issue, but try to solve it. Try to solve it yourself. And from this point forward, uh, I'm going to pass this to uh, Mr. Sanders, our legal advice, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Hello, my name is Pat Sanders. For those of you who don't know me, uh, with a lot of new members, I have to do that periodically. A little bit of business on the front side here. A couple of things that have come up that I think would be well if we talked about it a little bit. Um, one or two attorney, one or two of our members thinks that I'm their attorney uh, and have told ADs that, okay? So that's not accurate, okay? I don't represent anybody in the high school soccer referees association, okay? I am a special advisor to the board, to the executive board, and uh, I specifically do not represent the organization. I do provide you my best judgment on, on legal matters, but I don't represent you. So that's an important distinction to have and make sure that if you know, legal problems arise on the field, give Tom a call, give George a call, and they'll, they'll get me involved to the extent that I need to be. But please don't be telling people that I'm your attorney, okay? Because that's just not accurate. Three subjects tonight that I'd like to cover, okay? I've made a couple of notes here and uh, the three subjects I want to cover is COVID and assumed responsibilities. Um, number two, game management, misconduct, reports, and loss of control, and injury stoppages. Those are the three items for tonight. And so let's kind of do those in reverse order. The injury stoppages. There have been a couple of incidents that we've had toward the end of the fall season, and we've had a couple more in the spring now, where the referees see a player go down, they're holding their head, and the play is not stopped. Be careful there. Be careful there. We've talked ad nauseum about concussions, concussion management, how important it is to make sure that the players 
are safe. Now, when you see them, it's easy when they clang heads, they both go down. Those are the easy ones. The more difficult ones are the ones where people are going up and the elbows are flying and a person goes down or in a game that I had where they went down and they hit their head on the turf and bounced it. In those circumstances, get to your whistle right away. Okay, unless there is just a absolutely critical goal breakaway and you're absolutely certain it's not a head injury, let's play it safe, okay? Remember, this is not USSF, this is not college, this is high school, it's an activity. So let's make sure that we stay safe uh, and that Tom and George and I don't get the calls about our referees not stopping in an instance where it is clearly a head injury or in other cases where they, they get hit and they're having a hard time getting their breath, okay? And be very lenient with regard to the people who are on the field and playing with asthma or other sort of pulmonary problems where they're having trouble getting air. You know, get the game stopped, get them out, get them off the field. Okay, uh, so that's it on injuries and stoppages. If you have any questions, you guys know where to find me. 314-814-2129 is my cell. Text me, call me. Uh, we'll be happy to talk you through any issues on that. Uh, the second one that I really want to talk about here relates to a question that came up. You've all seen this. This was all sent to you if you're a member with Misha. It is a double-sided, five questions asked before the game begins. Those are always good to review, but I want to focus on the protest procedure, and I want to focus on an incident where one coach was stating that the other team was not in compliance with St. Louis County guidelines for COVID, and he wanted to protest. Now, understand that the Misha protest is not available for that. That is, as we directed you several times, that's for the school administrators, that's for the two schools to work out with each other. Here, and we're gonna ask them to put this up on the video when it's posted, protest can only be made for a misapplication of a rule, not a judgment call, and certainly not something that is totally outside the rules of the game. Okay, uh, so if there's a problem with that, then the way you're going to deal with that is just, if it starts before the game, then just don't start the game till you have an agreement on how this is gonna be handled. If it comes up during the game, it'd be the same as anything else. Suspend time, get it worked out, have them go see the administrators. But it might be good to have this in your bag if somebody wants to protest so you can point right to the rule that, that says that the protest is only available for those misapplications of the rule. So, wanted to make sure you're talking about that. The second item that I want to make reference to, and this is regards the first subject that we talked, that I indicated I was going to talk about, which is COVID, compliance with COVID requirements. Now, this has been very tough for everybody. It's tough on the school administrators. Uh, our crew was met the other night by them telling a gr three of us that we're going to wear masks when we're running up and down the field. And, you know, it's, that one was a pretty easy one because I was going home. Uh, we got it worked out. You just talk. You just talk your way through. But I wanted to point out that we're, we got a couple of reports of referees really trying to deal with and make rulings on whether or not certain teams or their or what they're doing is or is not in compliance with the COVID regs. There is very clearly on the second page, number three, first bullet, right there. Let me read it to you. Officials are not responsible for monitoring activities on the sidelines, such as social distancing, hand washing, symptoms of illness, or any other issue, okay? Elsewhere in here, it clearly states that any questions as to COVID or COVID compliance belong exclusively to the schools. You have it in writing from the state that they don't want you involved in that. If the two schools 
can't get together, and we haven't had that yet, they can't get together, then I guess the game's not played. But don't get in the middle of it. Put the, nothing good is going to happen from you being in the middle. The two schools need to put their heads together. Believe me, they've worked out things that are more serious than that, and they'll, they'll get the job done. So make sure that you're not getting into assuming responsibilities. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that, okay? For those of you who have heard me speak over the last 12 to 14 years, we talk about liability that officials assume. I mean, you got enough issues to worry about without going out there and doing something. If you have no duty to act as an official, and the state says you don't, but yet you still jump in there, you have assumed responsibility. Now, you can do that legally, even though the state doesn't want you there. You assume responsibility, then you're responsible to do it correctly. And, oh, by the way, that's judged by looking at it in the rearview mirror. So it's not going to work out well. So stay out of it. And I know we've talked about this two or three different times already, but yet our members are either not listening, not coming to the training, so just be careful here, folks, okay? This is a great way to get yourself into trouble. And they're going to be sorting it out in court two, three, four years from now, not under the current circumstance where everybody's all upset about it, but actually where they're looking at it, as I call it, in the rearview mirror. And they're going to say, fine, you jumped in, you, be, you assumed the responsibility, it's yours. You're letting the schools off the hook. You're letting the coaches off the hook. You're letting the parents off the hook if you're going to get in there and make rulings as to who's going to do what for COVID safety. Bad choice all around. Don't do it. Don't assume responsibilities for things that you're not responsible for. And that's one of many examples that we've talked about. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about some game issues that are, that are coming up. And this is what I call game management. Uh, there is there's a group of us who communicate, uh, they're attorneys with associations all over the United States, and it's kind of like Fight Club. What's the first rule of Fight Club? Don't talk about Fight Club. So I don't talk about what, what we talk about, but I can talk about some of the issues that are starting to arise. <clears throat> there might have been an incident where a game was being played, and there was a hard, strong tackle about a year and a half ago, uh, and it should have been a yellow. It was a nothing. Because of that, then there was another tackle going to the other team that clearly should have been a red, and it was a nothing. And then there's a third tackle, which fractures the lower part of the leg, takes out ACL, MCL, as well as tore, actually tore through the ligaments off the bone. And as luck would have it, or not have it, developed some MERS infections, they had to debride the bone, they had to strip out some muscle, and that, that kid's going to walk again, but it's a long, hard road. So now you know the rest of that story. So why, so the first thing that happens is a claim letter goes in against the school. School points to the referee, to the assigners. They're responsible. They're independent contractors. Referees saying, well, wait a second, you know, what kind of position am I in here? Now, this litigation is not, this dispute is not in litigation yet. It's still being talked about between the parties. But it's a very delicate balance because in that particular state, not this state, that particular state, they were part of that nationwide push about four or five years ago where they wanted to reduce the number of yellow cards and red cards. One of the first things plaintiff has asked for in discovery is by referee name, by year, what were the yellow and red counts? How many did you give out? And how many are you giving out now? And what's the ratio per game? 
to indicate whether or not there's external forces that are causing you not to report or not to give yellow and red cards. So clearly somebody has got the scent of this and are starting to deal with it. I think Tom's advice, which he has given on numerous occasions now, as has Rich, do your job. If it's a yellow card, give it. Yeah, you got to write it up. That's your job. If you typically give out yellow cards for certain offenses and that's what you're doing and you're not doing it, could be a problem. Could be a problem. Red card circumstances, give it out. If they've earned it, give it out. Second yellow, they've earned it, give it out. So in terms of game management, just be aware that all the yellow cards you give, all the red cards you give, all the special reports you write, that's all discoverable in litigation. So if you're not doing your job, if you're doing 30 games and you don't have a single yellow card on file for three years, you have to answer your own question there as to whether or not you think that's going to play well. Because the chances of that happening, that after three years you would have gone through 90 games and not given out a single yellow card if you're doing your job, I don't know. That's, that's where we are. So uh, a couple of other questions that people have sent in to me, and I kind of printed them off here, uh, and they were, not all of the fans are wearing masks, and the fans are also not a CDC safe distance from the field, and I can't get them to move back. What can I do? You go to the administrator and you get them moved back, okay? Similar question, but from a different crew, that the fans will not pull back from the fence line to create a safe distance. This particular one, there was no school administrator <clears throat> and the coach says, well, I think the fans are fine hanging on the fence three feet from where he's trying to run. Do I start the match? Can I terminate the game if I'm not getting cooperation? You know, our advice there was, look, at, get the school administrator. If there is no school administrator for either teams there, then the coaches. Bring the coaches together, get the problem solved. Okay? And then the last one was... The players on the bench were not wearing masks, and the coach won't enforce the rules. Can I card the non-compliance of the coach and the players? Okay, we've already talked about that, okay? That's not something you're supposed to be involved with. And no, you can't do that, okay? Finally, uh, it's a little late. We normally do this a lot earlier, like in March before the season actually gets started. But remember uh, what we talk about each year to anticipate the unexpected, to practice and use your de-escalation techniques, kind of what Tom was talking about, George talked about it in one of the prior ones, expect agitated reactions and prepare mentally for quicker match control. A lot of people have been cooped up for a long period of time, the players, the parents, the coaches, so just anticipate that. Communicate problems to that on-site administrator and step back and give them the time and the space to work. Okay? Don't fill it. Don't get in there. Don't make the discussions. Okay? COVID compliance, as the state says, not your issue. Thank you all for listening and appreciate it. Have a good day. Hi, I'm Jonathan Mills. I'm here to talk about intercom use during our in game matches. Um, I want to talk first about the features of intercoms, because I know some folks have asked me about uh, what are some of the features about the intercoms. Um, just real quickly, they use secure technology. So it's go either going to be cellular or Bluetooth technology. And that's really going to prevent other folks from dropping in on the conversation. So uh, don't feel as though wearing intercoms, outside agents are going to be able to listen in on your conversations. They use very secure technology. Uh, another one is that they're very easy to wear. The headsets are one ear pieces and they fit comfortably in there. Uh, you can actually get some molded ear pieces if you desire to make it really fit to your own specifications. I don't see too many people wearing a double headset, so um, it's very easy to wear. 
Another feature is the uh, open mics. Um, uh, this allows full conversation between all three uh, referees, or in some cases, four referees, if there's a fourth official. Um, the only exception there is that sometimes the fourth official is best to have a, uh, a what we call a push to talk microphone, where you actually have to, most of it, uh, you, we've seen it before, where you have to push it to uh, talk to, communicate with the other team members. That's really advantageous for the fourth official because he's doing a lot of conversation with sometimes with the scorekeeper at the table, could be with the coaches, could be with ball people. So it's very good to have a push to talk uh, microphone or headset for the fourth official. Another feature is, um, is they're very lightweight. Um, you could be worn in the pocket. Uh, it could be worn in the arm sleeve, uh, armband. Um, so they're very lightweight and they don't take up a whole lot of space. I wear mine in my breast pocket. I don't even notice it's there. Another feature is that they're noise canceling. Very loud whistles. They, people think, oh my God, I'm gonna, my ears are going to get blasted out. No, they have noise canceling uh, features which allows me to blow a whistle very loud if I'm in the middle. And the, the ARs are not going to get their ears blasted out. And finally, one of the, uh, the final features is they're very easy to use. Uh, they're easy to, uh, to transport back and forth. They're very small. They don't take up a lot of space in your, in your kit or your bag. So um, that's also one of the other features about it. Now we're going to move on to the three phases of using intercoms. There's three phases. One is when you're at home before you leave for the game. Two is your pregame uh, conversations. And finally is in-game. So let's take a look at, at the first one, which is going to be your home features. You always want to make sure that your intercoms are charged up, fully charged, particularly if you're going to be doing a, a double game, uh, double matches, JV, varsity, or sometimes uh, two college matches. Whatever it is you're traveling to, always make sure that you have fully charged uh, intercoms. Now, most of them have a very, very strong battery. The ones that, that we have, um, actually, I charge once a week, and that's based on doing about four games a week. So Sunday nights, I plug them in, get a full charge. I've actually used ours a whole day. Um, we booted them up at 7 a.m. We did games at, on the hour starting at 8 all the way till 5 p.m. And at the end of the game at the 5 p.m. at 6 p.m., all the comms are still working. And so that was continuous use throughout the day. So just make sure that you got a full charge, and if you're only charging them once or twice a week, still have uh, confidence in your ability uh, to get through a game on that. Also, one of the things is, unless you have a really long drive, um, I find it a best practice to actually boot them up and get them synced right before I leave for, uh, for, the, for the site. That way, I know I have that taken care of. If I have any issues, I'm not in a rush at the site. Uh, there's no optics to see as though you know, we're having problems. Uh, so. If you can do that before you leave, I recommend you do it. That way, when you arrive, they're booted up and they're all connected, and you know you've got a, a quality set going to work with. And finally, uh, inspect the headsets. The, the headsets, make sure that they're not cracked, there's no loose connections, uh, the foam pieces are in good shape and, and not tattied. So just make sure you get a good visual inspection before you leave uh, for your game site. Next up is going to be pregame. Uh, when we talk about pregame, there's two things that we're actually going to talk about. Equipment review and testing, and the other one is usage topics. So let's, uh, of course, I can't cover everything today, so, uh, and you'll see this a couple of times before. Uh, there'll be a note about, um, directed to my website, where you can get a full uh, long list of, of all these things that we talk about, particularly pregame discussions and topics. Um, but the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, your equipment review and testing. It's very important that uh, each crew member performs these actions and makes sure they have a comfortability with the units, particularly if they've ever used them before. As we get uh, more into the season and more usage and more people are using them, people are getting more comfortable with it. But you will still come across some folks who have never used them before. So you want to make sure they have a comfortability to it. So one of the things we're going to talk about is make sure that they fit, they get fitted properly, 
piece of tape on the cheek if they need it, uh, mic checks, make sure that the sound levels are appropriate. But you want to do that on the field, and I'll get that to you in a second. Uh, wear your units during the warm-ups. Um, this will get the real uh, test to make sure that the unit is there, it's proper, it's connected. Uh, somebody new is, is comfortable with wearing them, uh, running up and down. So it's very important that uh, particularly new folks uh, to these sets uh, actually use them during warm-ups to ensure the comfortability fit. And like I said here is adjust your volume level on the field. You can set your volume level back uh, if you're up on top of the stadium or maybe inside a, uh, a, an equipment room or something like that, that's not going to be the same as when you're on the field. So if you need to adjust your volume level, and this is into your ear, not for speaking volume, but to listening, uh, up or down, do that on the field during your pregame warm-up. Uh, next one, we're going to get into pregame usage topics and Q&A. There's some really important things, and I, like I said, on our website, uh, again, down here, refcoms.com user guide. Uh, it's a long, long list of, of everything that I could possibly think of and, and other um, uh, sources that I've uh, garnered information from. It's pretty exhaustive. So uh, let me know if you come up with something, and I'll be happy to add it. But uh, that's a reference point for you there. A couple of things to really, really uh, adhere to is speak slowly and concisely. Um, we have a tendency to uh, be up for the game and in the heat of the moment, it's always take a breath, speak slowly and concisely. Also, speak in short and concise manners. Um, we like to use the triplicate uh, form of information, foul, 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 off, off, off. Those type of information where it's repeated, it's slow, it's concise, there's gonna be no mis misinterpretation. Always try to use the word, or avoid to use the word no in these situations, particularly with no foul. We don't want to say no foul, no foul, no foul. The reason being is that no could get lost, particularly if it's a, 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 from either player noise or, or fan noise or just a, a, a temporary miscommunication. The center referee may not hear the no part. If you say no foul and don't repeat yourself, he may only hear foul, and he's going to blow a whistle. So avoid the use of the word no when at all possible. Uh, be precise in your, in, in your communication, team, color, number. That information is very important. Now we're going to get into, into in-game usage while you're actually in the game and you're using them. Uh, keep communicating. The angle of the view is always changing. We know that, whether it's a two-man system in particular or the three-man system. What one uh, referee may see is completely different from somebody seeing it side on. So always keep communicating. Keep communicating as much as possible. Uh, always try to acknowledge communication. A thank you, a copy, I got it that information, to make sure that that information that has been relayed to you, you've accepted it, and now they know that you have accepted it. Whether you do anything with that information or not, that's up to you. But confirm, whenever possible, any information that's relayed to you. Also, avoid speaking when team members are engaged with players or coaches. Wait for the completion or pauses. That's integral uh, for uh, Moments where you might have stoppages of play due to uh, two players getting into it. Uh, you got a caution and you got communication between a, a, a referee, a head center referee, and the, and the head coach. You may have information that is pertinent, but it's not ideal to speak over the top of somebody, particularly when someone is trying to communicate with someone else. So always try to make, wait for those pauses. And this is really crucial. When you get into that situation is, I have information for you. I have information. You wait for that pause. Center referee may be speaking to the head coach and they're, they're going at it or something along those lines. You may have some information that's not being passed on or that's impertinent. So you may say, I have information for you. And that way, the person receiving that information knows that for the next opportunity, when they have pause, they can say, OK, give me that information. Um, and finally, and most importantly, Keep your eye contact and always use proper mechanics. Intercoms are an enhancement 
to communication on the field, not a replacement for our mechanics. It's very imperative that we always do our proper mechanics, our flag signals, our eye contact, everything that we have learned up to the point before we had intercoms enter our, our realm of adjudication, we continue to do that. View intercoms as an enhancement, not as a replacement to any type of communication on the field. Thank you. And finally, for, like I said, for a full pregame checklist, go to our website, refcoms.com slash user guide. Uh, in addition, I'm always available, either uh, text, phone call, or email for information. Anything that you may have questions about, please feel free to contact me. I'm here. I'm available for you. Uh, I'll answer any questions I possibly can. If not, I'll try to refer you to some place that uh, would get you that information. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing you on the field. Good evening. I have two announcements to make. First off is our election for president to your term, Tom Smith, incumbent, which no one has put their name for that. Treasurer to your term, Dan I make Nimick, incumbent, nominees, Two of them, Don Huber, Dennis Helker. Two board members, Pam Bowman, incumbent, Kevin McGinnis, nominee, Bob Wallace, incumbent, Mark Ratatat, nominee. Second is the Shamana training session, July 26th, 5 p.m., 6.30 p.m. 27th, 4 o'clock p.m., 5.15 p.m., 6.45 p.m. This is Monday and Tuesday. This is for those first-year referees and referees that are new to the association to get some playing time as a referee and as an AR for the boys' high school soccer friendlies. Mentors will be assigned to evaluate the performance of each individual referee to help them better their skills when the season starts up in the fall. I will be sending out an email when it gets closer for the Shamana training to start putting up a list of schedule of referees that are wanting to participate in this. Other than that, everyone have a nice and safe evening. Good luck in the playoffs, and we shall see you soon. Put a close to this third session for the 2021 season. Oh, there is a downside to this whole thing. I forgot that. Those tapes or these sessions that you're supposed to be watching, uh, those are monitored to find out who's watching. So please do us the, do us the courtesy of... Uh, Reviewing, paying attention for a little bit. It's not like you got to drive to Parkway West and sit and listen to us. You get to do it in front of your own computer. Uh, we have the capabilities to answer your questions with regard to that. You can send that back in and we can get your answers. And what was the other thing, Pat, we were just discussing that my brain just went to, to blank on? Thank you, everybody. And I want to thank everybody for being part of this. The other part is the downside of this whole thing, our dues is going up to $70, folks. Unfortunately, uh, according to the bylaws, we're supposed to go to 75 the cost of a varsity, uh, varsity game. But I chose by dropping it to halfway, $70 is a fair rate since you've been getting a pretty good pay for the last couple years. So those kind of things are going to uh, take place and we will go forward. And again, I appreciate everybody paying attention and hopefully, hopefully we get through this season without too much problem. Thank you.